Um, so ID likes the likes uh, at least two of the first half of the year's presentations to be kind of refresher courses for those of us who are experienced and um, courses for identification for those who are beginning butterflies. So this is the second installment. I don't know how many of you were here at uh, Bob Hardwick's Hair Streaks of Washington. A few, a few, a few of you. Um, I don't have the advantage that he does in the fact that he has seen every species that he is presenting. I have not, so I'm going off of a lot of what books like this say. Um, and uh, I suggested that I do the swallowtails and the uh, whites and sulfurs, but she said she wanted me to do the family, so she didn't mention if I wasn't supposed to do the Parnassians or not, so I figured why not. Why not? So we'll, so we'll start, out, start out with the Parnassians, of which Washington has only two species, and they are readily identifiable. Our first one, and the one you're most likely to find, the, one you're, the only one you're likely to find in the Puget Sound region is the uh, Clodius Parnassian. This, this occurs all of western Washington up into the Cascades and occurs in the Blue Mountains in southeast Washington. Um, the most notable feature that they have is the black antennae. Completely black antennae, as compared to our next species, which has black and white barred antennae. But there are a couple other hints. Um, Clodius parnassians will never have red spots on the forewing here, just red spots on the hindwing. And if you ever do see a female and happen to take a look at her rear end, if she is mated, uh, parnassians have what are, what is called a sphragus, and it's kind of like a mating plug or, or a or a. Uh, Fidelity belt. Um, so it prevents the female from mating after the male has mated with her. He secretes this onto her abdomen so she can still lay eggs but can no longer mate again. And on the Clodius parnassian, it is very large and white. I know that's kind of a bit low for a lot of people, but it's very large and white on the female. So typically they are at lower elevations, um, especially compared to our next species. They fly late April through September, peak in July, maybe June at lower elevations along the, sea, along the seaside, all the way from sea level to subalpine, and you find these a lot in woodlands trails. Go out onto a forest service road um, in, the, in the foothills of the Cascades. You will be rewarded with these guys, hundreds of them. Um, on my Monte Cristo trip last year, I actually had to ask the question after the trip, is everyone now sick of seeing Clodius Parnassians? And I actually got a couple of yeses calling. <laughs> I can't believe you were sick of seeing that guy. Their, their, their host plants are bleeding hearts in, in the uh, Decentra uh, genus. Our second species is the mountain Parnassian, um, of which they have a little bit more red. They often have this red, these red spots on the forewing, um, but not always. Sometimes we'll get a little bit of a uncolorful one, and those uh, red spots will be rather, rather shrouded. For example, in the uh, picture in the front, I mean, there's not really much red up here, but this is a mountain Parnassian, as you can tell by the white and black barred antennae that the Clodius Parnassian does not have. So white and black barred antennae are going to be your, your sure sign of what species you have. Um, white and black being the mountain. White, or white and black being the, Marna, being the mountain, and the Clodius uh, having completely black. Um, females have quite a bit more red than the males do, and if you take a look at their sphragus, um, it's not a good picture, but it's small and brown compared to the large white sphragus of the Clodius female. So typically they are high, at higher elevations than, than the Parnassian, all the way up to the Alpine. You go up on our mountaintop trips up to Quartz Mountain, uh, Chumstick Mountain, you see a lot of these guys. Uh, they feed on stone crops up there. Um, they typically fly late April through October, peak in July, and uh, habitats are summits and montane areas. So after I get done with the group, I am going to do a little bit of a quiz. Uh-oh. Just to test you, just to make sure you're listening. So which one is this? Oh, yes. Nectar oh, yes. on Dongbin, and why? Black. Completely black. Whereas this one is? Smintheus. Smintheus. Black and white antennae. So then we get to the swallowtails, which I'm sure is the reason why most of you came tonight, as opposed to going out and having a drink on Cinco de Mayo. 
Um, now, unfortunately, we don't have this one or this one. We don't have those gorgeous southeastern butterflies, unfortunately. So, but we do have this one, our big western tiger, which I will talk about in a little bit. We do have some gorgeous ones. This is the Oregon swallowtail, uh, currently recognized as a subspecies of, an old, of the old world swallowtail. Um, you'll notice that it's quite a lot like our common species, the Anna swallowtail, right here. But what you look for, typically, is this red spot down here. The black spot is not in the center of this red spot. It is often touching the edge, off-center. And you'll notice that the Oregon swallowtail tends to have more yellow, on average is, is yellower, than the Anna swallowtail. Um, you'll often find it, you'll, well, you'll mainly find it in hot, arid regions, a place that Anna swallowtail is infrequent, but you will still find them together. But if you're in hot, arid lands, this is, that's where you'll find this. Uh, places where it's lost a lot of habitat to dams uh, because it's dried up a lot of the edges for, of water courses for its host plant. Look at the underside, once again very anise-like, and you see that black, black spot off-center of the red spot. Now, Stuart brought up a, a good point on bug day when they had uh, loads of specimens out of anise and this guy. And sometimes that black spot is not touching, but it's still off-center. But if you don't have an anise swallowtail to compare it to, you know, you're kind of you're kind of on your own there. So you have to use things like habitat, maybe how much yellow there is, um, and just hope that a combination of traits will get you through that. But hopefully after seeing the anise, though, you'll see what bullseye really means. Maureen? I thought anise had black abdomen. That's really variable. Um, it's in the books. It says that Oregon swallowtails typically have a much, much more yellow abdomen whereas the anise has much more black, but I've come across um, anise swallowtails that have half and half, and you know, you might, you might easily call that a... Is that too dark? I think, the, I think the presentation's better if you can't see me. <laughs> so mid-March, mid this is an early flying butterfly through mid-October, has two generations. First generation peaks May through June, the second one August and September. Um, like I said, arid canyons, slopes, and plateaus, it will do a lot of hilltopping, especially in, in the spring. Uh, because it is a more uncommon, it's the more uncommon of the two generations, where in this, uh, the one in August, it's very abundant in the right habitat, and they just cruise wherever. Because they are so abundant, they're likely to find females, whereas in the spring they will hilltop to concentrate looking for those females. Uh, host plant is uh, Artemisia dracunculus. Dracun 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 Thank you. Um, <laughs> la uh, common names? Your common name is like work dragon wormwood or something like that. Sometimes a wormwood, but it's wild tarragon. Tarragon, that's what I was looking for. So here's a picture of it in its very arid habitat. Once again, note very yellow compared to a more black and a swallowtail. And you see those, you see that red spot with the off-center black mark. Whereas look at the anise, bullseye, bullseye. Not, the black spot is not touching the outer rim. Uh, on average, a little bit more black than the Oregon. Another look at the, under, uh, look at the underside, more black, and a bullseye. Picture of it uh, mudding up its Tahitian. And this is one of our most common swallowtails in uh, the state, uh, being, having a wide array of acceptable habitats. You know, you'll see it in it's, it's a strange coincidence that it's dropping out of places like Seattle when we have wild fennel and Queen Anne's lace abundant in our, in our urban parks and on the, on the uh, streets, but it seems to be more of a habitat issue and it is dropping out of the cities, but if you go out of the city, you'll still find it. I get reports of it from Bellevue and Issaquah, so it's still in some of the, some of the smaller cities, not downtown Seattle, though. But you'll find it from sea level to Alpine. So habitat, where is it not? Well, Seattle, as we just mentioned. Most plants are carrot family plants. So things like carrots, dill, parsley, you can put in your garden. Um, in the wild, you'll get cow parsnip, angelica, a uh, number of different things. Um, flight is late March through late September, peaks in May and August and September. This is another um, two-brooded species. 
And by brood, I mean, by brood for those who are beginners here, we, we mean uh, generations. So it has two generations in a year. So Indra Swallowtail, this is one of our more rare swallowtails and one of our more uh, sought after and beautiful. Um, very black, very black for a swallowtail. Um, and you'll notice the tails aren't really that long. They're just these little short nubs. So very coal black butterfly, um, short tails. And you'll find these a lot, a lot of times out in uh, canyons. Um, Icicle, Icicle Canyon um, near Leavenworth is a good place to find this butterfly. This is an early flying butterfly, uh, late March to mid-August, but more peaks in May, not June. But it's a single generation per year, not a, not double brooded. Marsha? That looked pretty white. Is it like really a pale yellow on that? Or white? That, that's, that's pretty pale. Um, typically, it'll be more yellow, but more, perhaps... But, but not for a dark yellow. Huh? Like a pale yellow. It's a, it's a pale yellow, okay. um, but there is variation, and so okay. I got these off of the uh, butterfliesofamerica.com website, and so I, there's a number of different uh, number of different specimens, and I chose one that more exhibited the nice coal black here. Could be a worn specimen, uh, could be a variation, but more often than not will be a pale yellow rather than a white. Um, so lots of different uh, lots of different habitats. But typically, if, you're, if you get a half a dozen in a trip, that's a really good day for this species. It's really not a common species. Uh, host plant is Lomatians. Um, any other host plants you can think of, Stuart? No, but uh, I was trying to think of Lomatium for the Amis. Lomatians are also important for the Amis. Yes. So, Indra Swallowtail. So, see, here's, yeah, you're right, Marty. It's, it's kind of a pale yellow. But you see that coal black. So, mostly black swallowtail. Short tails, this is also one of our smaller swallowtails, averaging about two and a half inches, whereas most of our swallowtails are three to four inches. Did you mention this one's only east of the Cascades? This one is only east of the Cascades. Thank you, I should mention whether it's west or, west or east. Um, so yeah, Oregon swallowtail, only east of the Cascades, Anis, both, Indra, E. So this is the what we have nicknamed the, the Puget Sound Monarch. <laughs> <laughs> this is more often misidentified as a monarch because people know the name monarch, they see a large colorful butterfly, who can blame them for calling it monarch? Um, we do not have monarchs in, in western Washington, we have swallowtails, in particular the western tiger swallowtail, and how lucky we are that it is as common as it is. Um, large, yellow, long tails, a little bit of blue and orange, very nice, and those big black tiger stripes. Complete the masterpiece. The bottom side, much the same as the top side, a little bit of blue along, along the margins. Uh, host plants, many broadleaf trees, willow, aspen. I found it on alder a few times. There's reports of maple, but primarily aspens and willows are, are its host plants. Um, so, black cottonwood's a good one. Uh, Pacific willow, if you have a garden and you want to track this species, quaking aspen or schooler's willow or smaller species of those genuses, you can try. Um, it's a mid-April through September butterfly, peak in June, so in the next month, you're going to start seeing this butterfly come out, if it warms up at all. Yeah. It's May, right? It feels like March out there. Um, so, this is kind of one of those butterflies that I wear, is it not? Riversides, canyons, woodlands, urban parks, and gardens. It's, it's a little bit of everywhere. But pretty much all forest edges and openings. It is an edge butterfly, as, as many of its uh, host plants are. The, uh, aspens and the willows. It, it can actually use almost all of our broadleaf deciduous mm -hmm. trees. Very, very adapted for, our, for our, uh, our shade trees that we like for the summer. And then we have its conspecific, the Canadian tiger swallowtail. Um, and, it's, and as Bob Pyle mentions in the Butterflies of the Cascadia book, it's almost if it can read its name, because it barely dips down into Washington. Um, there's been a few records in Okanagan and well, his theory is that they actually are more common in the northeastern part of our state. Um, but people are just so used to seeing tiger swallowtails, we don't bother to sample them all. So that there may actually be one in every 50, but who samples 50 swallowtails when there's a whole bunch of other butterflies flying around? When, if you live in Seattle, you've seen tiger swallowtails. But the main difference with this one is the first spot on the leading edge of the, of the hindwing is orange. Whereas on the tiger swallowtail, 
there is none, or it, or it is yellow. On the underside, these yellow, the yellow spots that the tiger swallowtail has on the underside will be orange. But often it's one of those things you have to catch it to see it. Otherwise, you're going to immediately pass it off as a tiger swallowtail. So this is a, this is a butterfly that lives down in the northeastern part of the state. We don't know if it really is a breeding resident or not. It likely is um, occasionally, but it's just, it barely dips down. So, you know, it needs to go back to its Husan kind of day. Could you go over the underside to get yes. the... Yes, yes. So very, so very orange, but this, this is a tr uh, particularly dramatic individual that I found on the Butterflies of North America website. Whereas the Western Tiger, these are yellow. But this is a butterfly you have to either get really close to or net. And often you'll see it kind of has a more pale yellow than the uh, Western Tiger. But you get a warm Western Tiger and it can have a pale yellow as well. So, Do you see many of the dark morphs, females, out in the wild? No. The, the Eastern Tiger Swallowtails, which is a different species from our Western, that's the one you get the dark morphs, the one that look like the pipe vine swallowtails, uh, the dark iridescent blue ones, because those are toxic and it pays for the female to look like a toxic butterfly um, so the predators leave them alone. We don't have the pipe vine swallowtail here, so our females do not look like the pipe vine swallowtail. Now, the pipe vine has, has uh, colonized California within the last 75 years and is progressively moving north. So who knows, we may, we may start to see our western tiger shift to that, that the eastern tiger has already done. Um, I have some experience with the eastern tiger swallowtails because, you know, because I worked in the uh, Woodland Park Zoo butterfly exhibit, and their behavior is really different. The eastern tiger swallowtail is kind of more of a fluttery, I'm pretty, look at me. And if you've seen the western tiger swallowtail, that thing is a jet. I mean, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fighter. So it, it's, it's swooping in and out of canyons, um, just really barreling out there. So it's, it's a very strong flyer. Um, for the Canadian tiger swallowtail, host plants, same, same as, the, uh, as our western tiger swallowtail. Many of the same habitats that our western, western tiger swallowtail. Some consider them to be the same species, just subspecies. Um, just about the same flight period as our western tiger swallowtails have, and barely a Washington butterfly. But let's get to our biggest swallowtail in the state, the two-tailed swallowtail, one that eluded us on our Kawishi trip on uh, Saturday. Um, big swallowtail, at least five inches. I caught a female that was six inches. Just gigantic bugs. Now, one immediate difference you'll notice with this butterfly compared to our other tiger swallowtails, it has two tails. One tail, two tail. Ah, uh, three. Like three. Yeah, a short stub. There is a three-tailed swallowtail down in Mexico. Um, but yeah, a little bit of a short stub, but two very obvious tails. A little bit more blue than our tiger swallowtails, and a lot more yellow. Look how thin those tiger stripes are compared to the Canadian and our western tiger. So you can actually tell in flight, usually, that this, that this is a two-tailed swallowtail, because you'll see a very yellow swallowtail, and it's huge. Um, so it's good, to, it's good to note the uh, thin tiger stripes, because as we know, birds that prey on butterflies, this is a deceptive mark to, to, uh, for birds to target the wrong end. This is supposed to, these are supposed to look like eyes, and these are supposed to look like antenna. And often you see swallowtails, they are missing the tails. So if you have a two-tailed swallowtail and it is missing all the tails, mm -hmm. you need another, you need a backup. So very thin tiger stripes and its size. This is the female, a little, little bit more blue, quite a bit more blue. And the female does have a little bit thicker stripes though. But the size should save you on that one because Females can be gigantic. It's the second biggest butterfly in the entire United States. The giant swallowtail with an average wingspan of about six inches um, is the larger of the two. Underside, once again, much, much the same as the top side. We're kind of seeing a pattern with our swallowtails here. Top side and bottom side look much alike. Um, this is an eastern Washington species. Um, host plant, prunus species. Uh, so naturally, 
uh, things like cherry. Choke cherry is one of its main host plants in our area. That's the one they use in Kawichi that we were looking for. We found the choke cherry patches, did not find the butterfly, just a bit too cold, a bit too windy. Um, in urban areas, places like Wenatchee and Yakima, it's adapted to using uh, shade trees like ornamental ashes. Um, so that's helped increase its uh, population in urban areas. So, you, so if you go to eastern Washington, you go to cities like Yakima, Richland, uh, Wenatchee, you'll see this flying in the suburbs. Um, this is an er earlier flying butterfly. It's another thing that can, help, that can help you with identification is where the western tiger and the two-tailed fly. Uh, the the two-tailed will usually be the earlier flying of the two um, by at least a couple weeks. So you'll see fresh tiger swallowtails to fairly worn two-tails. But the late spring, like we're kind of having right now, may push, out, may push the emergence back for the two-tailed. They may fly together. Um, so canyons, riverside, uh, Sherblands? <laughs> Spell check. Um, our last swallowtail, the pale swallowtail, didn't really feel like it needed a, a spread because this is our most identifiable swallowtail. First of all, it's pale, it's white, um, and look at these huge tiger, stri tiger stripes. And the border is really thick and black. So, I mean, it's white and it's really black. I mean, not, not as black as our Indra, but still pretty black. And this is, a, once again, another butterfly that flies earlier than our two, than our uh, then our western tiger will often fly in the same period as the two-tailed. Um, peak in May through June. Uh, host plants, it has a wide variety of host plants from Ceanothus, Ocean Spray, Alder, Bitter, Cherry, Cascara, many, many others. Um, it's uncommon west of the Cascades, common east of the Cascades. We've actually found a couple of, uh, a couple of individuals on zoo ground, so occasionally they will show up. Um, but definitely not a common butterfly west of the, uh, west of the Cascades, but sea level to summits, um, lots, of different, lots of different habitats it likes. You'll find it in the alpine. Um, you'll find it in the, in the arid bottomlands, pretty much wherever any of these host plants grow. Stuart? I just want to say that I, I first learned Ceanothus was its was host plant, uh, mountain bomb sometimes called. Uh, mm -hmm. and I remember going to Bashan Island looking for the Ceanothus population I heard was there and looking, looking for the Ceanothus voluminous, this uh, uh, sometimes called mountain balm or sticky laurel. I found the tree and then I found the butterfly. So the, uh, I, and you can find them commonly on Kitsa where there is some Ceanothus, but uh, here where there's lots of ocean spray, lots of red alder, lots of bit, uh, bitter cherry and cascara, you don't see, you see zero or hardly any um, uh, of the pale swallowtail. I thought I saw one, I thought one of my students caught one in Seward Park once, and then Jonathan Pelham said, I want to see the specimen, I don't believe you. <laughs> I wasn't going to kill it to get that one for the specimen. It was in a place where there was a few Ceanothus. Now I have to go back, hmm, was it really a pale? Uh, <laughs> Pale a version of a Western tiger swallowtail, or was it the real thing? Uh, I didn't know what else to look for at the time. I didn't keep. I didn't kill it for a specimen. The thick, the thick black bars. Look, look for the thick border and the thick black bars. Mm -hmm. But I do think it's more closely associated with the Ceanothus than all those others. Mm -hmm. Though in it is. The others it is. In, in places where all where many of these occur together, it will use Ceanothus preferably. Um, and Ceanothus is often a, a drier country plant. It likes more drier sites. It's I actually it. fire adapted. It won't fire adapted without yep. fire. Yep. And so generally, will go grow in rocky areas that are fire prone. Mm -hmm. So that's, that tends to be where you find the butterfly. Now I had to throw this in there because we got this at the Woodland Park Zoo exhibit, and I couldn't believe what, what we were seeing. Does anyone know what, what this is? That's a neat job with Photoshop. <laughs> <laughs> this is a gynandromorph, and it means half male, half female, straight down the middle. Wow. It is a genetic screw-up. <laughs> but it's cool though, because when, I, because when I first saw it, I thought that maybe another butterfly had expelled some, some feces onto it and stained it. 
until I took a look at it and I know this is, so this is an eastern tiger swallowtail. You're seeing kind of the similarity between the western and eastern. You can see how some people might think they're the same species. Um, so this is the male half, and then this is the female, of which we actually have all three phenotypes present in this one butterfly. We have the regular yellow female with the, little, with the blue, and then we have the dark form female that is supposed to look like the pipevine swallowtail. So this is a really cool genetic screw up. <laughs> so I just, I just, I, I, I beg my manager, can we please take the specimen? It's, it's a one in a million chance. And Aaron said, nope, we're gonna let it fly. But hey, it was a really cool teaching, teaching opportunity for a lot of the visitors to say, look at that, look at that screw up. <laughs> so what'd you call that? A gigandromorph? A gigandromorph. <laughs> it's a, it sounds like a word you, you, you'd hear on Jeopardy or something like that. <laughs> So yes, gynandromorph cannot, cannot reproduce. Basically, it's a dead end right now, but it sure is cool to look at. Can I break that word up? Go for it. Gyne is female, andro is male, morph is form. Fem uh, female, so, male, female so, male form. Yep. Now, not like a hermaphrodite, where a hermaphrodite will have two function, will have um, both male and female functioning reproductive systems. This is literally split in half male and female. Right in half. So, swallowtail quiz. <clears throat> Top one. It's a very poor picture because it was taken 30 feet up in a tree, but who is it? Two and a half tails. <laughs> Call it out. What's, what's your guess? Two Call it. Two tails? No, why two tail? Yeah, and I'm, not, I'm not quite sure I can see two tails on it. It's a bit far away. It's very yellow. Nice. Very yellow, very thin, very thin stripes. Good job. So that that is our two tail. And a, uh, oh, I uh, just can't. <laughs> can I guess? Come on. Okay. What's your guess, Colin? <laughs> Colin, what's your guess on that? Good job. Good job. All right. Anyway, you'll see the bullseye spots on the on the orange dots. Okay. Not gonna do it that time. What's this one? Some kind of flops. Here's, here's. <laughs> <laughs> That's verbena. No, no tails. Bird, bird likely nipped them off. So we are left with the stripes to tell us who. Western tiger. Yeah, Western tiger. What, 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 Western tiger? Why? Well, we know it. Well, we know it's not an anus because anus do not. Anis or Oregon because they don't have those stripes. So this is one of our tiger swallowtails. So Colin. Why? Because I said something. <laughs> <laughs> Good reason. Yeah, well, the well, yellow stripes are really, really thick. Yeah. The, the yellow stripes are thicker than you would expect to see yeah, on a two tail. And they're darker. And then darker. Yeah, yellow. Yellow, the yellow, the spots yellow are yellow, so it's not our Canadian, although given the option between the two. Should assume it's a Western, considering how much more common they are than the, than the Canadian, and it's our yellow swallowtail that has thicker bars than that. So that is our Western tiger. Is it the Western? It's the Western. Yeah. Oh, okay. Questions? Good Back to that. Did you say anything about the bodies? I mean, is the anus body typically black, or is it always anus black? Anus body. The the literature says that it averages blacker than say the Oregon swallowtail, but I don't use that as a as a mark. Because as a uh, defining mark, because the anise that I've seen can have even half and half yellow to black bodies. Um, so there is some overlap with the Oregon, but typically they will have darker bodies than the Oregon, but once again, that's a, on average they will. So I don't use that as a defining mark, but it is one taken with the fact that it's a little bit black of a butterfly, plus the uh, bullseye um, black marks and the red spots. Maybe you can use a combination if you're confused. Um, if you think you might have an Oregon swallowtail in your hands, you can say, well, let's look at the body and just see what that looks like. Just another one of your tools. Hey, do Oregons ever have black abdomens? They more often have yellow with some, with some black markings, but once again, I mean, I've seen ants with half and half. But if it was a But if it was a really yellow abdomen, that's, that's, also, a, that's also a more defining characteristic of an Oregon. Second, second part of the quiz. Indra. Indra. I'm hearing Indra's all around. Mm -hmm. yep. yep. Indra. Very, very black. Short, stubby tails. Number five. Okay. You sure that looks, that looks kind of yellow right here? 
Yeah, but look how fat those stripes are. There you go. Okay, yep, that's right. That's that's a pale. So even though this one's a little bit yellow, you see those big, thick, that big, thick black border and the big, thick black stripes, and that's that's pale. And now uh, we have nothing, isn't that it? That is really pale. Well, that's I think yes. we've gotten to the whites. Yes. <laughs> I know what it is. I know what it is. Ah. There you go. It's a blizzard of whites. That's what you go. Okay. So our first, our first white, one of our most identifiable whites, the pine white. With a name like pine white, you can guess what it lays its eggs on, right? Alfalfa. 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 No, it's nectar on alfalfa, not laying, not laying its eggs on alfalfa. The pines, so ponderosa pine in the eastern, eastern Washington, that's its favorite host plant. West of the Cascades, it'll use dug fir, um, it'll use uh, lodgepole pine. Um, this is a late summer butterfly. Oh, forgot to say, this is, the, this is the female. This is the female. The males are all white. All white. Some black on the forewing tips. You'll see this little um, indent into there with, with the black. And then the veins on the underside are outlined in black. Very dainty little butterfly as well as its flight. It's a very soft flying butterfly. So in August, look up in the conifers, and if you see a butterfly just kind of floating there, it's a pine white. Generally, you'll see them hovering by the top halves of the conifers. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that, those are males that are looking for females. Females, I am told, I still haven't ever found a female. But they have this red on the outside. Like lipstick edges. It's kind of like lipstick edges. That's a good way to think about it. Now, now, I've heard that they come down early in the morning. You know, something like when it's just warm enough to fly, that's when they will come down and get their nectar, and then they go back up in the trees to hide from, from the males. <laughs> but, so this is, a, this is a late summer butterfly, which is kind of nice, because as, as our butterflies ebb, this is a nice one to welcome onto the scene. Uh, peak in August, so coniferous forest, neighborhoods within forests are good. Uh, downtown Seattle, it doesn't, uh, they're not really here because it doesn't have the, full, the nice forest. But if you're out a little ways, maybe Issaquah, North Bend, um, you still might see this guy. They're in the city parks. They are in the city yeah, parks. They're, they're in Seward Park. Good to uh, know. More some years than others, but can be common. They're at Camp Long. Uh, more some years than others, but can be common. Good to know. Yeah, very, yeah this is one of those eruptive uh, butterflies. Occasionally years, we will have a mass of pine whites for reasons we don't fully understand yet. The next one, Becker's White. And if you joined us on Kawichi, you, you saw this butterfly, but we only saw one. So normally, we see hundreds of them. A very common eastern Washington butterfly. Uh, top side is white, generally. Sometimes the females are a little bit of a pale yellow. Um, very few white markings. You want to look at the bottom side for a lot of our whites to tell, what, to tell who they are. That will be the diagnostic characteristics that are on the, are on the ventral side. And you'll see a lot of this greenish marbling, which, by the way, the greenish marbling isn't green scales. It's a mix of black and yellow scales, giving that greenish appearance. But you'll see this large white break in the green pattern. And that's going to tell you that, that, that it's a Becker's white. Host plants are mustards. A lot of our whites use mustards. Um, the pine white's kind of the odd man out. Uh, flight is mid-March, mid-September, peaks in May and August. It has two generations. I found the spring generation is usually the more abundant, at least where I found it. Um, it's typically a drier country butterfly, sage step, coolies and canyons. So, looks like the first generation is mostly past us, at least in eastern Washington. They seem to have responded to that warm March weather we had, and then maybe died out early with the cold April. But in all, you have another chance to see them again in late summer, if you go to eastern Washington. Our third white is the spring white. Um, top side looks quite a bit like our uh, pine white in a way. Very dainty, I mean. Doesn't really have the very strong um, black four-wing tips that the pine white does. But this is a Eastern Washington only, very early spring butterfly. Now, actually, I shouldn't say Eastern Washington only. There is a unique subspecies to the Olympic Mountains that flies in August. Um, but very dainty as far as uh, the the uh, veins edged in black. Um, bottom side, though, looks much like our Becker's. 
Um, but instead of seeing that, that large uh, white break, you're going to see a white spear mark. Do you, does everyone see that spear? Yeah. There's, the, there's the tip here, and then there's the, the, the shaft here. But mostly what you're looking at is kind of yellow-edged veins um, bordered in black or brown for the spring white. And it's a dry country butterfly, very early flying, peak in April. Back to so, the Becker's strip, but the Becker's sure. has that, um, that white spot in the center of the black spot, the, oh, the forewing. I have, I have seen Becker's with, with the black completely eclipsing the white. So but do you no ever white. see a spring white that has the white center to the... No, I do not. Okay. So, so there's, there's another good point. If you do see a white centered black spot, you're more likely seeing a Becker's than anything else. So yes, and please feel free, if anyone knows of any um, ID characteristics that I didn't mention, because there are a lot for some of our species, go ahead and chime in. Okay, another one on your uh, spring white, if you put that up, on the uh, Schneebly trip, uh, Dave Nunley pointed out that the, the veins don't touch around the periphery of the hind wing there. On the top side or bottom side? Uh, yeah, on, on the bottom side. So okay. where you're pointing there, oh, those brown you. veins on the okay. hind wing do not touch each other at all. Okay, I don't remember reading that, but okay, so we see that, they, that, the, uh, that the brown black scales kind of go to the terminus of the wing. And then they do not connect to each other. Right. Whereas if they you look at the Becker's, well, else. I don't know. Those don't really quite connect. There's a lot more separation on your spring light. There is. But I'm not sure how reliable that is. But the spear, the spear mark is a good mark, and it's one that as soon as you see it, you'll see it for the rest of your life. And typically, if they're flying together, this is more of a brown-black scaling than the, than the uh, yellowish scaling of the, you know, the yellow-greenish scaling of the Beckers. And this is an early flying butterfly. I mean, in one generation, peaks in April, I mean, the peak is gone. Especially with the early, with the uh, warm, late winter we had, and then the very cold, early spring we had. Luis? Where on the Olympic Peninsula? Where? Where? Hurricane, where, Hurricane Ridge. Um, I haven't seen that subspecies, but I've heard Montana. Hurricane Ridge. Yeah, and that one comes out peaks in August because of because of just the late season up there. You know, things don't even get started until June. So yeah, just just one um, just one generation. Uh, this generation you're you're going to find in eastern Washington. If you want to see, if you miss this one and you still want to see a spring white, go to the Olympic um, Mountains. Hurricane Ridge in August, that's where you'll see the unique endemic subspecies to the Olympic Mountains. Um, host plant, same as the Beckers, uh, different cresses and mustards, and it's a very dry country butterfly. But in the, in the Olympic Mountains, some subalpine ridges, it can also be found on. And cresses are mustards. Cresses are mustards, yes. I, I just like throwing them okay. all sorts of things. <laughs> common, you'll find common names of, you know, cresses, mustards, Crucifers, so yeah, there's a number of different common names. Um, checkered white. This is one that has found, been found maybe just a handful of times in Washington. It's an immigrant from the south. So as populations build up in the south, it goes, it goes north. It'll infiltrate this area um, in, uh, in high summer. But this is one that would not be often found, in fact, You'd more, often, you'd more often find our western white instead of the checkered white, but they're very easily confused to each other, so you can see how closely they are. On average, and this is just on average, the checkered whites are more lightly colored than the, uh, than the western whites. So the males of the checkered white, more lightly colored than the, more white than black than the western white. And you see the darkly marked western white female compared to the more lightly marked uh, checkered white female. Once again, this is just on average, not a defining characteristic. Underside, kind of these brownish, maybe yellow-green um, markings. This is a summer individual, the most likely individual we would find in, uh, in eastern Washington. Because this, this is a species that has multiple generations, and so as um, they come up, and this is the generation you're going to see is the very lightly marked individual. This is a spring individual down in Las Vegas. 
and you'll see how heavily marked it is. Western white usually much more, much more heavily marked, some dramatically marked. But you'll see you don't see that spear. You might see a f some arrowheads, but you don't see that shaft in the middle. So this is the mark you would be looking at with the spring white right here, but then there would be an uninterrupted mark here with the spring white. And this is usually a later flying butterfly anyway. Um, but hey, maybe we could get a hay delivery from the south, and we could have a couple of chrysalises of the, of the checkered white of the spring generation kind of dropped off in eastern Washington. So who knows? You kind of have to keep your eyes out for it. Um, so, so checkered white, it's an immigrant. It's only been found maybe half a dozen times in Washington. It's definitely not a breeder. Uh, Western white, two to three broods are much more common of the two. Um, host plants are still mustards. Um, habitat varies a little bit more. Checkers are more, more likely in disturbed, kind of weedy, vacant, vacant lots. Westerns are in more open montane habitats, but that can definitely overlap when you consider the immigrant nature of the checkered white. In fact, this is from the Butterflies of Cascadia, what Robert Kyle says, the business of telling these two native whites apart is seldom simple and sometimes futile. The two insects, gestalt, jizz, as the birders call it, together with their habitat and behavior, may enable you to acquire a reliable search image. Any records of the checkered white in, nor in the Northwest should be accompanied by voucher specimens or by good photographs, both dorsal and ventral. Good luck. <laughs> He, he has told me he is guilty of trying to turn a western white into a checkered white because it's such a rarity here. I mean, John Pelham was, said he was kind of questioned at uh, Lepidoptera Society meetings down there that he was spending all this time catching checkered whites. And all his colleagues down there say, why are you spending so much time catching such a common species? He's like, because I'm from Washington. I don't see them. <laughs> so this is our, what I would like to call the forest white. I think that would be a nice common name. It describes its habitat more. But this is called the margin white. Um, and it's, it, it's white. I mean, there's very few markings on these guys, especially in high summer. The spring individual is more darkly marked, especially the females. This is a female, kind of a light yellow, very heavily marked veins. Um, but in the summer, this is the summer generation, two generations a year, sometimes, sometimes three, sometimes four in an early spring, late fall year. Undersides, ve veins are outlined. Summer individuals, very unmarked, can be very yellow. Can come, can, you can mistake it for a sulfur in some cases, but very unmarked in summer. And then on the spring individuals, only outlined veins. You, stu you do see that sphere mark but this is primarily a western Washington butterfly, whereas the spring white is an eastern Washington butterfly, and this will fly all throughout the year, whereas the spring white is only in the spring. The, the, the margin white is, is in eastern Washington in, in the moister parts of eastern in, Washington. In, Blue Mountain, in the Blue Mountains in particular, you can find it there. But you'll, pr you'll primarily find this in western Washington. So darkly marked in spring, lightly marked in summer, host plants, an array of different things I found it feeding on our, um, our on the base of uh, watercress. Um, so yeah, so three to four broods, depending on weather, peaks in April, June, and August. Um, it's, a, it's a fan of, of the woodlands and shady places. Once again, our, our field trip to Monte Cristo uh, yielded dozens of these guys. Uh, forest service trails are great habitats. This is a butterfly of the forest. So, you know, places where um, urban areas start to creep in, these guys kind of start to disappear in lieu of our next one. The most, the most familiar and yet more often unidentified or misidentified critter in Seattle, this is often called the cabbage moth because it's not pretty and it feeds on my cabbage. And butterflies can't be pests. <laughs> butterflies are nice. But this is the cabbage white. It is a butterfly. And it is our most common butterfly, um, most common white anyway, in western Washington. Um, so as we, as we clear forests for, for uh, development, 
We make the habitat more suitable for the alien. This is, our, this is one of our European butterflies. We only have two, the European skipper and the cabbage white. And more non, uh, well, not good for the native, the, the margin white. Um, the cabbage white, though, is a very distinctive butterfly. It's a, it's a nice butterfly to have so commonly in an area where we have very few butterflies. Um, very identifiable and great for kids as far as raising their the butterflies are a breeze to raise. Just put out some cabbages of broccoli, you'll get them. Um, sexes can be told, pulled apart pretty readily. Males have only one spot in the forewing. Females have two spots in the forewing. Um, they have this nice uh, black forewing tip. And undersides are often unmarked. They can be very yellow. They can be very white. Um, but regardless, it is an unmarked ventral hind wing. And it is through a little chrysalis, just, just for fun. Mm -hmm. right. Very common butterfly in your backyard. It is flying right now, the first generation. Start looking for it. Mm -hmm. um, many garden vegetables, it is the bane of the, of the vegetable gardener. Almost any habitat, it seems like, it seems like there's not a habitat that uh, doesn't have these guys. I have found them out in the Cascades before. So they do, they do stray from, from their uh, urban and farmland habitats, definitely. Um, multiple broods, peaks in May, July, and September, and one of our two introduced species. So now we get into the, um, the non-traditional whites, the marbles. Ones that aren't called whites, but are called marbles. This is our large, mar large marble. Um, one of two species of marbles in, in our area, or at least the classic marbles, and called marbles for obvious reasoning. So this marbled underside. But this is highly confused with our other marble, the desert marble. Um, name says a little bit on this one. This is kind of more of a, more of a dry country um, butterfly. These are both eastern Washington butterflies, except for the subspecies of large marble that is found on San Juan Island. But typically, they're both Eastern Washington butterflies primarily, but you'll find this one in a much wider um, array of habitats. Canyons, montane meadows, stage set, pine and aspen forest clearings, whereas the desert marble you will find in places like desert flats, sage step, juniper forest, gullies and coolies. Um, Schnebly Cooley in, in late March is a good place to find this bug. Um, it's, a, it's a good hilltopper. Um, both of their host plants are, are uh, several crucifers, once again, another common name for mustards. Um, of these two, uh, the desert marble is also one that flies earlier. Desert marbles peaks, peak in uh, April. Large marbles will peak May through June. This is called the large marble because this is the larger of the two, but if you don't have the two to compare beside each other, well, you know, you may not quite know. There are a couple of marks you can look at. Number one is the coloring on the, of the marbling. You see that yellowish, uh, you see the greenish kind of color to this, once again, made up of black and yellow scales. But this has a much more yellow color to it, seen on this wild individual um, from Chumstick Mountain. Very yellow wash to the to the marbling. On uh, which species were we? Were that was still. So this is the large marble. Yes. Very yellowish still green. Still large. Still the large. Desert marble, average is smaller. And that uh, that marbling is more of a dark sage green. Some have called it a blue green. Some have called it a gray green. But very kind of sage green, darker marbling than the than the large marble. Um, sometimes these forming cell bars here, these black cell bars, can be quite impressive as far as their size. More often in our area, you'll see them like this. In the large marble, they're often also very skinny and, and are often suffused with quite a bit of white scales as well. Another common name for this butterfly is the creamy marble. And for the desert marble, another name is the pearly marble. And that has to do with the color of the white. This is a very flat white, very creamy not really reflective. Whereas the desert marble 
in the right light, this seems pearly. It's a little bit iridescent white. I know from photos, you have to be at the right angle. It's not nearly as good as having a live bug in hand. Um, but these guys, they're much, they are much more of a pearly, iridescent white than the large or creamy marble. And once again, look at this marble, the desert marble. Very kind of sage green, maybe a blue, maybe a gray green, but a much darker green than our yellow green large marble. So, very confusing species, but given the flight time, the color of the marbling, should help, should help you out. What do you know about the island marble? Island marble, it's a very cool subspecies. I'm, I'm hoping to pitch an idea to study that for my master's thesis at Western. Um, it was thought to have gone extinct in 1907, and it was rediscovered in 1997. Wow. Um, they have since found other colonies than the one on San Juan Island, but it lives in just these very rocky, um, kind of seaside, rock slide habitats. Just looks like a butterfly would not want to live there, but that's where its host plant grows, so that's where it lives. Um, it, it's the host plant, it will use if at least a couple of our non-native mustards. Well, the one, the, one at, the one that was rediscovered in 1997 was found to be using our non-native mustards. So our state parks are kind of a little bit of a conundrum right now because they want to remove the non-native, but here we have an endangered subspecies depending on the non-native right now because the <clears throat> natives are gone, so they're kind of a little bit of a conundrum right now. You know what that, plant, you know what that plant is? Mustards. So um, the, it's the garlic mustard that they're using? No, no. I, I, I actually, if I may, was the one who went on the survey party and identified the first two mustards that it was using, found them laying eggs on. So it was using uh, Sicimbria maltissimum, the tumble mustard. It was using uh, Brassica rapa, or rapi, the, um, the uh, field mustard, or rape, as the two non-natives it was using. And those are both common. And then in addition to that, Bob Pyle later found them using the native uh, lip, uh, Lepidium, um, uh, what was it, uh, the um, non-native, the native, uh, what is it, Lepidium virginicum, uh, which is, and it was a race that grows along the beach, in the upper, upper beach. I think the uh, American camp was really Oh, they found them in the American camp. Exactly. Well, it was terrible. They didn't say anything about it. Except maybe from bubbles. It's also the gravel pit. Or spit. Yeah. Do you have Friday Hybrid? Before you get to it, it's called the gravel pit. If you ask the locals where the gravel pit is, they'll point where it is. Our last white, the Sarah's orange tip, really distinctive white. I mean, it's, it's related to our marbles, you can see. Um, if you're looking at the underside, has, has a straight line of white unimpeded by any marbling. Something like the spring white, but it's not a sphere shape. It's just a white line unimpeded, but you don't really need that white line. You have these big, these big <laughs> orange wingtips to look at. That's going to give it away more than anything. So male, female, females are yellow, males are white. Moving along. So open habitats. Definitely not in deep forests or urban areas. Host plants, once again, mustards. You're seeing a theme to the whites here. Um, peaks in April um, in low elevations, July at high elevations. This is one that just has uh, one generation. Interesting fact about Sarah's orange is probably true for a couple of other of our whites, but this guy can remain in the pupa for several years until breeding conditions are favorable. Up to five years. So, white quiz. Top one. Deckers. Deckers. And? Because? Break. That break. break. Yeah. Not a lengthwise break, a width break. Yeah. Oh, shoot. Mm -hmm. Marble. No, no. Oh, western white. Right. Now saying western white. How about spring white? No? Yeah, spring white. Yeah. Well, here, here's that, here's that arrowhead mark. Yeah, I think you're right. But that was, that was fair. But that's impeded. Yeah. So this is a western. This is a western white. Okay, a very bad photo of this butterfly, but if you know your whites, it'll get you through. It's got to be the margin white. Silver! <laughs> 
Okay, Colin said sulfur. Yeah. Kind of looks like a sulfur. It's kind of yellowish. Oh, I know. Mm -hmm. It's the margin. It's the margin. Very clear white, unmarked. Usually with the cabbage whites, you'll still be able to see that four wing tip through the underside. It's not on the underside, but you can see through it. This is just a plain, this is just a white, mm -hmm. completely white. So this is the summer generation of the margin white. Uh-oh. Fine. Fine, Fine white. Fine white, easy one. Cabbage. 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 Female. Female or male? Female. Female. Let's do, let's do this one. Another margin. Which one is this one? Margin. Margin, yes. Margin. This is the spring spring generation of the margin white. And last one. Spring. Spring white. There's your spring white. You see, you see that spear right through the center. All right. So the sulfurs. Give me a chance to. Uh... Okay. As far as I know. Uh, it, it has been found. But he's on, the one. To, he's the one to ask. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, I, I actually saw it once on the so-called Dusty Miller, uh, closely related, uh, the tansy ragwort, the Senecio jacobia, and this Dusty Miller is another Senecio. Uh, so it it same it genus can use at least one so, other Senecio. Uh, I worry about it using a threatened Senecio after we've been promoting the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, anyhow, it, it potentially, I, I would worry about it using Senecio uh, macunii, which is a rare um, butter weed. Okay, so how many of you own this book? Good. Good. Okay. So if, you, so if you go to page 152, John Pelham has graciously provided a key to the sulfurs of Cascadia because we need one. <laughs> sulfurs are really hard to tell apart. There are a few keys to look for, but they are very variable. And, boy, I mean, there's, there could be two species in here. They all kind of look the same, but... They're not nearly so hard in Western Washington. They're not hard in Western Washington at all. <laughs> in Eastern Washington, that's where most of them live. So our first one, the clouded sulfur, otherwise known as the common sulfur, because it is very common. Um, this is the typical male look of a sulfur. Very yellow, solid borders, whereas the female is also yellow and has these fenestrated borders, so black borders with holes in them. So with the clouded sulfur, the other species you're going to get it confused with is the orange sulfur. And by that name you can tell that that species is going to be more orange than this guy. And look how orange that one is. Yeah. That's, that's, but that's a pretty well marked individual. There can be, I mean the Burke has taken out specimens of orange marble that range from this deep orange to white. So once again, extremely <coughs> variable. However, the clouded sulfur is our only resident sulfur of the two species. The orange sulfur is another immigrant, comes in. Bottom side, this nice yellow. We're and they still all, unclouded. We're still unclouded here. Sorry, I should, I should keep that straight with all of my jumping around and doing with the sulfurs. Um, and they have what are called urethene spots, which are these spots along the hind wing. And urethene comes from the, um, the Latin name of the orange sulfur, Callias urethene. So they're called urethene spots because that species have them. Several other species also have these spots. They've been called the urethene spots. But either way, they're referring to these spots here. Um, so clouded sulfur has urethene spots, but these can be faint. They can even be absent. Um, Al Wagar caught the uh, Snohomish County record of the clouded sulfur last year, and it had no, had none of these urethane spots on it. Um, I forget what they call this spot. If you'll excuse me. That's cheap. <laughs> I guess they just call it the discal spot. Anyway, discal spot, usually pearly, um, and it is, it's uh, double rimmed, and by double rim they mean they have the rim 
immediately circling this, and then they have kind of a second rim out here. And sometimes they'll have a satellite spot, a second silvery spot. But once again, this is an extremely variable, but variable butterfly. Your best bet is the top side with the nice lemon yellow, with the nice thick borders. And often you'll find these guys next to places like alfalfa fields, um, where they will be using alfalfa. They also use a number of other uh, plants in the pea family. But females can sometimes be very white. <coughs> In which, and so can the orange sulfurs, in which case, your guess is as good as mine with the white females. There really is not a whole lot to tell them apart with. <laughs> so cloud, clouded sulfur risen in the beach, east, east cascades, uh, straying westward in the summer. Um, multiple broods, depending on the year, could have three to four. Uh, host plants, Fabaceae family plants, so alfalfa, clover, sweet pea, vetches and many types of habitats, especially for those moving, you know, immigrating westward can be in several different kinds of habitats. Already touched on the orange sulfur a bit, that rich orange female, once again the fenestrated borders, but will have that rich orange on it. Sometimes not all will be orange, it will sometimes just have a patch of orange here, but there will always, usually always be orange present. But once again it has the white, white females. Now typically, this is once again just typically, if you find a white female, the ones with the more extensive black borders will be the orange sulfurs. If you look at the clouded sulfur, not so complete borders, but this is just on average. I'm still seeing a little orange in that white female. A little orange, but they can be very white. These, I was just getting photos that were available to me on the website, so I just have available specimens that have been caught. Mm -hmm. Bottom side, much like our clouded sulfur, nice early theme spots, double rimmed uh, discal spot, a little bit of a satellite there. Um, so oftentimes though, you will be able to see the orange patches through the ventral hindwings though. So you look for the orange or the nice yellow to tell these two species apart. Um, orange sulfurs infiltrate Cascadian summer. Otherwise, it's a non-resident non -resident throughout much of our area, but it's common in open habitats. You go to an alfalfa patch in September, hundreds to thousands of these guys. Um, and because of that kind of uncommon abundance, because of these big patches of, um, of alfalfa, common sul uh, the uh, clouded sulfurs and the orange sulfurs will often hybridize, in which case, <laughs> I know, I know. Where do these guys migrate from? The south. So Las Vegas, California, places where they can fly year round and then they come up here when the weather's decent. So here's a picture of an orange sulfur. You can still see that orange flush through the bottom side. Nice airy theme spots which will set it apart from some of our other sulfurs later on. Still the same with the, cl with the clouded sulfur though, but look for that orange. So western sulfur. This is one of our common sulfurs of the Cascades. We see a lot of when we go to our nice flowery meadows in the mountains. Um, clear yellow, like the clouded sulfur. Not quite as thick, thick of borders, but the borders are still there. So if you don't have a clouded sulfur specimen to compare it to, it might not be the best tool. Females, fenestrated border. Not a, very, not a very large border, though, though, for a female. You'll notice this compared to some of our other uh, females from the clouded sulfur, though. Very thin black border for the female. But look at the underside. No worry theme spots. Nothing. And just a single rim, so just circled in red once, not the second time discal cell spot, and never a satellite spot, never a second silver spot. So a very kind of just clear yellow butterfly throughout, and you'll often find it more in the mountains, in the flowery meadows. Um, this one also has quite a bit of uh, this black dusting. You can see kind of the dusting of black scales through here. This will help separate it from our other um, sulfur that is very clear yellow, the pink edge sulfur. Uh, host plants are lupins and pea vines, um, probably some other ones in there as well. Uh, peak in June through July only has one generation. This is, this is the uh, Western Sulfur again. 
So just one generation for the western sulfur. Meadows and forest settings, mid montane foothills in the Cascades. Uh, sea level actually in western Washington in some cases uh, to the Olympics. Uh, to sea level in, in the Olympic mountain range. So here's a picture of it. Now didn't I just say it didn't have a, it never had a satellite spot? Yeah, it did. Mm -hmm. it's really too big to be a satellite. And look at that pink edge. All of our sulfurs have pink edges. I will say that. Now we do have a sulfur called the pink edge sulfur, and we'll see that later, but the pink edge on that sulfur is very vibrant. This is kind of a vibrant pink edge, yes, but this is definitely not, not a, um, definitely not a pink edge sulfur, because Dave not only said so. <laughs> um, but we found this up at Reeser Creek, this is a Reeser Creek Canyon butterfly, and uh, pink edge sulfurs are not known from that area, so sometimes you can use range to to uh, throw these guys out too. Is that eye greener than usual, or is that me? That's a, that's about average, yeah. They have, they have a pretty average for bright green eyes. Or average for the sulfur. Average for the sulfur. So a lot of the sulfurs have these bright green eyes and pink antennae, and they're really really knockout bugs. So pink edge sulfur. One thing one thing that is, is, uh, Bob Pyle mentions in his book is that the black border of the male kind of broadens inward towards the tip. Whereas on the male western sulfur, it really doesn't as much, but once again, if you don't have the two side by side to compare, kind of tricky. I mean, our sulfurs are tricky. Kind of like, our, not as bad as our fritillaries, not as bad as some of our blues, but still tricky. Are those sort of cracks in the outside border typical, or is that just unique to, or variable from specimen to specimen? I have never read that. It may be, but I've, but I've never read that that's a, but that may be something to look for in the future, though. Um, bottom side, once again, very clear yellow, no worry theme spots, just a light black dusting comparatively. And look at those rich pink um, margins. Oftentimes, you'll be able to see, see this in flight. Now, this is one that I'm not, complete, not being completely honest with you. I can't say this for sure. I've never seen this butterfly. So <laughs> I'm just telling you what I've read so far. Uh, this is in the northeastern part of the state. Um, host plant is very different from the others. Host plants for the pink edge sulfur are vaccinium, so blueberries. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes you'll more see this in forested um, settings, and the flight has been noted to be slower and much more deliberate and relaxed than our other sulfur. So before you maybe catch it with a net and then have to worry about markings, maybe just stand back and watch it for a little bit. See what it does. See what host plants it hangs out in. But a butterfly, a uh, sulfur, you're more likely to see in the northeastern forested sections of the state than the mountain meadows of the Cascades. Once again, I've never seen this, so I can't say that for sure, but that's just what I've read. <laughs> um, here's the female, very light yellow, fenestrated borders, very, definitely not complete borders as compared to our common sulfur, or clouded sulfur, or our orange sulfur. Let's see, is there anything else to mention about this one? The dot in the middle of the thorax? <laughs> that's, the, that, that's the pin. That's the pin. Um, so, so habitat for this one is meadows, burns, roadsides, and mid-elevation forests. It's in the northeastern part of the state. Uh, I believe they have been found in the southeastern portion of the state as well. Very, very southeast. They kind of dip into northeastern Oregon, um, but they're not in the um, Middle East of the of Washington, though. Um, one generation, peak in July. Queen Alexandra sulfur. Okay, so here's some here's some more of the yellow markings that you're talking about. So maybe it's not species specific. Uh, this is our biggest sulfur. It is a big sulfur. I haven't seen this, so. Thing I'm telling you has been red. Um, but notice how thin these borders are compared to how you know large this butterfly is. It's a really yellow butterfly. So this is the male. Females are often often barely have a border, if any, often lacking a border. Now we have two different subspecies of Queen Alexander sulfurs in our state. They look pretty different. This is subspecies Pseudo-Columbianensis, and it's kind of a it's a it's a much richer yellow than, than the other subspecies we have. 
its flight has also been noted to be kind of slower, more relaxed. Um, there are no early theme spots, and the satellite and the um, the discal spot is often just just there, no real red rim around it, with, as with our other species. Just there. Edward Z is mo noted to be more greenish blue. So you see the difference between these two subspecies in color. This is found in the northeastern part of the state. Edward Z is found in the southeastern part of the state. So near Ellensburg, Yakima, you're going to find this subspecies. And this subspecies is more apt to be cruising canyons, very fast, rarely stopping. So you can tell the difference between the two subspecies by flight. Host plants, no veggies and alfalfa, one generation, peak in July. Um, subspecies Edward, Edwardsii has been found in steppes, semi-desert, dry canyons. Like I said, flight is stronger and faster. Pseudocolumbiensis is in more forested habitats or burns. Uh, flight is slower and it pauses frequently the nectar. Uh, so the Labrador sulfur is our only green sulfur. Look at how green that is. However, this is a butterfly that only occurs in just the very northern tip of Washington. Uh, Horseshoe Mountain is a good place to find this. Bob Hardwick tells me that it's another butterfly I haven't seen. I'm sorry. Is that in the Pusatin? I'm sorry? Is that in the Pusatin? Maybe that's not for sure. I believe so. It's, it's very northern Washington. It's a good, it's an, and it's a good hike to see this guy. And Bob Hardwick has told me they're very wary. And they'll fly about 30 feet ahead and then disappear and will only reappear when you startle them to fly 30 feet farther. And you just, he says, it'll, it'll be worth the effort to see it, but you will have to put in the effort to see it. Um, our only male that does not have solid, uh, our only male so far that does not have solid black borders. Female, that still fenestrated borders, much the, kind of looks much the same as the male. A um, little bit more black, heavy dusting. Greenish on the other side, has a little bit of very themed spots, but you're going to find this on mountaintops, cold places. Its host plant is alpine milk vetch, possibly slender crazy weed. Um, one generation, peak in July and August because it is very, at very high elevations. Um, you'll find it some at 6,000 to 8,000 feet. Uh, very wary and erratic. So it's a, it's a good goal, but you're going to have to put forth the effort to, to find it. Uh, yeah, Horseshoe Mountain is a, is a good locality. Bob Harvey and forth to find it. So our last one, and probably one that you may never see again, but Bob Hardwick found, um, not Bob Hardwick, Bob Pyle, found seven individuals in southeastern, um, in southeastern Washington, and that warranted including it as, as a Washington butterfly for him anyway. Um, this, is an, this is an immigrant, and dainty sulfur is a good way to describe it. Very weak flying, and it is small. It's about an inch. Most of our sulfurs average about two inches or so. Um, Queen Alexander sulfur, about two and a half to three inches. This guy, about an inch. So, very tiny butterfly, very distinctively marked. Doesn't really have a border at all. Just has these black markings in the forewings, a little bit on the hind wings. This is the female, a little bit more orange, ventral side, very distinctive, very distinctive sulfur. You know, completely different group than our sulfurs that we have otherwise. Um, but one you're not likely to find. It's, a, it's an immigrant, and it's a rare immigrant, but get more people out there looking, especially along water courses. That's where Bob Pyle found the seven, was along the uh, Snake River, I believe it was. Um, we may find more of these kind of shit. You may find more of these uh, come in on their own on their own strength. We do have other possible strays. Uh, this is the cloudless sulfur, a huge sulfur, kind of a highlighter yellow. Uh, sleepy oranges have been found in Montana a couple times. So definite possibility. Some of our sulfur, a lot of our sulfurs in the United States, are, um, they do wander quite a bit. So they can um, infiltrate Washington. You just have to keep an eye out for them. So last thing, last quiz, then I'll take, then I'll take your questions and 901, so not, not bad, David, not bad. Um, first one, and I will not blame you if you get these wrong, I'm even questioning some of their identity. So. 
That's an orange sulfur. Orange sulfur. Orange sulfur. Okay, very deep spots. You see the orange flush through there. Mm -hmm. That that's that's a good individual to to look at. Okay, so here's the two trick ones. Which one's this one? Do you think? <laughs> it's a sulfur. It's a sulfur. Hey, sometimes that's good enough with these guys. Green eye and alfalfa. <coughs> You said pink edge? Yeah. That's a pretty strong pink edge. Yeah, Look at all that. Okay, so first let's say what it's not. It's not an orange sulfur. It's not an orange sulfur, and it's not a clouded, no erythene spots. Not a spot. Single, single spot, no satellite spot. Heavy scaling. <laughs> Heavy scaling. This is a western sulfur. Look at all that black scaling. What did you say? Heavy black scaling. Even though this is all yellow, there's quite a bit of this black dusting in throughout here. And this one? That's kind of a skinny pink edge. Sulfur. It is a skinny pink edge. It's a vibrant skinny pink edge. <laughs> but, but, look at that clear yellow. No real dusting in that one. Alfalfa sulfur, the, the, otherwise known as the orange sulfur, alfalfa sulfur is another common name for that one. No erythene spots. According to the website where I got this picture, the Butterflies of America, which is headed by some of the leading lepidopters, so I'm going to trust them. This is a pink edge sulfur. That's so heavy black dusting on the, on the wings. Western sulfur, very clear yellow, pink edge sulfur. However, this is one that, you know, using range will help. Um, by looking at your field guides, so you'll why, see kind of where they fly. Luis? Why isn't it Queen Alexander? Why isn't it Queen, Queen Alexander? Because this is rimmed. Oh. Whereas, whereas in Queen Alexander, it'll just be there. You know, it'll just be a, a white spot. No red, red or dark rim around it. Who's that? You just talked about it. I did just talk about it. The dust in the so this is Queen Alexander. Very, <laughs> it is heavy dusting, but the, the white spot, not bordered at all, not rimmed, just there. No ray theme spots. Now, a little bit of a hard quiz, which subspecies is this? Pseudocolumbiensis or Ed Edwardsii? Edwardsii. Edwardsii. Edwardsii is more of a, is more of a greenish uh, yellow than a clear yellow of Pseudocolumbiensis. But hey, you know, getting to species with these guys is hard enough, so let's not really worry about subspecies. <laughs> um, last one. It looks like an anemic Parnassus. <laughs> it's the dirty sulfur. Colin. Dusty sulfur. No. Yeah, I don't know. Think of a dog. Think of a dog, Colin. What? Oh, Labrador. Labrador. Uh -huh. This is the Labrador sulfur. Green. Green sulfur. Green sulfur. Yeah. So Labrador is smaller than the others. Labrador is a is a much smaller sulfur. Yes. So so this is so it's hard to identify our sulfurs by photos because you're not getting things like, by these photos you can't get things like habitat, you don't know where this photo is taken so you can't use range, you're not seeing it actively flying so you can't use behavior. So there's a number of other keys that Bob Pyle talks about in this, many other um, field guides talk about their behavior and show their range. So when out in the field you'll have many more tools to use than just looking at photos. This is an identification by markings lecture don't have live sulfurs for you to, to look at, unfortunately. That is it. So so don't, so don't get discouraged. This is not the sulfur section, confusing, I know. But you guys got the whites and the, and the swallowtails down pat, right? Right. right. And, and, and the Parnassians, no problem. Sulfurs, though, definitely use definitely use Pelham's uh, guide in, in the in the book.